Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Okay. First of all, I would like to say welcome to Ad America, the U.S. Embassy's American Center. And my name is Ara, and I'll be the MC for today's event. And for those of you new here, Ad America is the U.S. Embassy's American Center, and our mission is to provide a space for Indonesians to learn more about the United States through our programs, events, and also our facilities. Today, we are already joined by our wonderful speakers that will be sharing their knowledge on our event today, Mastering Law in California, Your LLM Journey Begins Here. But before we start our event, we have a social media quiz for our online audience. And the question is, which of the following is not a degree that allows you to practice law in the US? Is it A, Master of Laws, B, Master of Legal Studies, G, C, Juris Doctor, or D, Doctor of Judicial Science. You can submit your answer on our social media platforms, and for those of you who can answer it correctly, we'll receive a live shout-out by the end of this event. And now I'll be passing the stage to our moderator for today's event. She is an Education USA advisor. Please welcome Caroline Darmanto. Thank you, Ara. So uh, everyone, uh, welcome to Ad America and welcome to one of the many Education USA Ad America events. Uh, thank you for spending your Saturday morning with us. Uh, you know, and thank you also for your enthusiasm to further your study in the US. Uh, so before we start the event, I want to introduce to you of what Education USA is and what we do here. Um, all right. So Education USA uh, is an, an advisor network under the US Department of State, and we're available in six cities in Indonesia. And we have eight advisors in total. Uh, so if you look at the map here, we have one in Aceh, we have uh, two in, in uh, sorry, two in Jakarta, one here at Ad American, one at the U.S. Embassy, one in Malang, one in Surabaya, and one in Makassar. So if you notice that any of your city is not listed on the map, you don't have to worry because if you scan the QR code, the barcode that's on the uh, bottom right there, I. Uh, just click on it or scan, uh, click on the link or scan on the QR code, and then you'll be able to make an appointment, online appointment with any of the advisors in Indonesia um, anytime. Uh, the fun fact of Ad America or Education USA Ad America is that we're open every day from Monday to Sunday. We're available from 1 to 9, except Saturday from 10 a.m. to 6 uh, p.m. So you don't have to worry because we're going to be with you, we're going to be guiding you and advising you throughout the application process. And Education USA is uh, known for the five steps, and that's something that we're going to guide you on. 
So the first step would be researching your options, such as today if you're going to be researching which LLM program is best for you, which schools you have to go to, and stuff. And then the second option, uh, you know, the second step is researching uh, the scholarship options. It's financing your studies. So we'll be able to guide you in the process of the scholarship applications. Um, you know, helping you read the essays, making sure that your application is on point before you submit it. Um, and then once you have that ready, we will also help you with the application process. The third step, the application process, is something that we get a lot of questions on. So a lot of people here will be asking us, how do we write a good CV? How do we write a good resume? What do we need to put on our essays? And that's a common question. And if you don't know where to begin, where to start, that's very normal. That's fine because that's why we're here. So we'll be able to guide you, we'll be able to discuss with you in terms of what are your strengths and what do you need to put on your um, your application just to make sure that you know, you, you're actually highlighting your strength and it's right there. Um, once you get the application um, completed and you're, you, know, you are admitted at a university, we'll be moving on to the fourth step, which is uh, the applying for your US visa. I know a lot of people are worried. Uh, is it hard? Is it difficult to get a visa? Is the interview scary? Um, it's actually not. So Indonesian students have one of the highest uh, acceptance rate for US visa. It's actually above 90%, meaning if you submit your, app, you know, your visa application uh, honestly, truthfully, correctly, you don't have to be afraid because chances are you're gonna get the, you're gonna get the visa. Right? So that's something that we're gonna be guiding you on also. One that, you know, once that's, uh, that's good to go, uh, we'll be arriving on the fifth step, the last one, which is your uh, pre departure orientation. Uh, that is something that we do annually here um, every July. So once you're ready to go, we're going to bring you in uh, along with all the other, uh, you know, students who, who's going to be leaving uh, sometimes uh, June, not June, but July, August, or September. Um, so you'll be able to make friends, you'll be able to network, you'll be able to also hear more presentations from the alumni, current students, and the university representative, just to make sure that you're all ready to go. You're good, you have all the information, you know what to bring, what not to bring, what to prepare before you go. All right, so those are the five steps. So you don't have to worry about anything because we're here, uh, you know, we're gonna be with you in every step of the way. Uh, all, we, all we ask of you is you actually do and commit uh, all the work you do, do the work, commit uh, to all the processes, and you know um, we're here. So don't be afraid. Even if I'm not here, any of the advisors and any other CTs will be able to help you out. All right. So that's the introduction of Education USA. But today we're going to be talking specifically about LLM, about law schools, and that's something that's very interesting because that's something that we don't do often. We usually talk about essays. We usually talk about resumes, um, visa, but specific. You know, specific talks about law school is something that's rare. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to my uh, co-moderator for today, Anya Grossman, the Senior Director of Admissions and Recruiting for the Advanced Degree Programs Office from UC Berkeley, California. All right, Anya, welcome. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you so much for having us. We're really, really enjoying our time here in Jakarta, and uh, this is a great venue, and really appreciate the opportunity. So you can, uh, so the, the stage is yours. Uh, you okay. can introduce the speakers and start the presentation. Then we'll, I'll be helping you with the Q&A later. Awesome. So we're here to talk about life and law in California, where you can go surfing and also earn an LLM degree. <laughs> um, up here on stage with me are three representatives from some of our schools, and then later we'll hear from two additional ones. So this is Simona Grossi from Loyola Law School, Nicholas Kajimoto from University of California Gold School of Law, and Kari Hornsby from the University of California Irvine School of Law. And we'll introduce uh, everybody in a little bit. So this is our plan here. And here are our beautiful logos. All right, so we're gonna do a little photo quiz. Uh, these slides in between have beautiful photographs of different uh, iconic parts of California. Um, so we'll just ask the in-person audience uh, to yell out if you know what the photo is of, and then everyone who guesses correctly, we have a uh, tote bag for you at, afterwards, and we'll uh, hand those out. Um, so first one, does anyone know what this photo is? All right. That's right, it's the Golden Gate Bridge. Congratulations. Tote bags, beautiful. Life and law in California. 
Oh, great. So I'll go ahead and just quickly introduce all of the schools. So Nicholas Kajimoto is here to represent University of Southern California Gould School of Law. And here is the QR code for their website. So USC is a top 20 law school in Los Angeles, California. Um, they're a great option to look into because they have full tuition scholarships and housing stipends and an application fee waiver before March 1st. They have a number of different uh, LLM degrees and those are listed up there. Their most popular is the Master of Laws, both on campus and a fully online version. Um, and they also offer a number of certificate specializations. And they also have bar tracks for New York, California, Washington, and DC, and other ones on a case-by-case -case basis. This is me uh, representing Berkeley Law LLM degree program, and that is a QR code for our website as well. You can also Google all of these websites, but we think QR codes are exciting. Um, so Berkeley Law is a top 10 law school located in Berkeley, California, which is in the East Bay of the Bay Area, Northern California, right near San Francisco and Silicon Valley. Uh, we offer one LLM degree um, in two different tracks. So an executive track, it's a more flexible, non-traditional uh, schedule and a traditional track. Um, and then we also offer a number of certificate specializations listed up there and also bar eligibility for California, New York, and more. Oops, sorry about that. Next is UCLA, represented by Tiffany Parnell, and you'll hear from her in a little bit, and their website, QR code as well. UCLA is a top 20 law school, also located in Los Angeles. It is 10 to 15 minutes away from the beach, always a nice thing. Um, they have generous scholarships and a flexible curriculum. Uh, they have really a lot of LLM degree specializations. So you can see those up there and also a self-designed curriculum that you can pursue if you don't find something that really fits your interest up on this screen. Uh, they also offer experiential courses, clinics and externships. This is career services support, programming, and resources, and also California, New York, and other state uh, bar exam eligibility. Then we have June Sakamoto, Dean of Enrollment Management, which you'll, who you'll hear from a little bit later as well, representing UC Law San Francisco, and another QR code. I told you we're fans of the QR codes. UC Law San Francisco is the top ranked school in the heart of San Francisco, so that's very close to Berkeley, so we love them. Um, they have brand new academic buildings that I've been hearing a lot about, and they sound really, really beautiful, uh, and on-campus housing. Um, they offer an LLM in US Legal Studies with eight different specializations listed up on the screen, um, and a practice training certificate, uh, which is very cool, hands-on ability to, to get practical work experience. Um, as I mentioned, guaranteed on-campus housing, uh, which is pretty rare in an urban setting, so that's exciting. Uh, career development and bar passage support services, an LLM to JD transfer options, and generous scholarships and application fee waivers available. And then we have Kari Hornsby representing the University of California Irvine School of Law, and another QR code. So UC Irvine is a top-ranked law school located in the heart of Orange County, which is in Southern California. And it is uh, ranked as, well, the city of Irvine is America's safest city, ranked that way for the last 16 years, quite a long time. Uh, it's in the top 10% of US law schools, which is pretty impressive, given that it is the newest of the law schools represented up here. Um, they have great LLM experiential programs, clinics, externships, law journals, and pro bono opportunities, an LLM to JD transfer opportunity, bar prep for California, New York, and other states, professional development advising for LLM students, and it's minutes from the beach and Disneyland and more. <laughs> and last but not least, Simona Grossi, professor of law representing LLM, LMU Loyola Law School. Lots of L's going on. And, and the final QR code, or maybe not, we have to see. <laughs> 
So LMU Loyola, it's a boutique LLM experience, also located in Los Angeles, in downtown Los Angeles, right near all the courthouses and many law firms. They offer a bar track LLM uh, specifically designed for people who are intending to take the bar exam. Um, and also six LLM specializations. They're very well known for their programs in civil litigation and trial advocacy and more. So lots of great opportunities. Definitely make sure to inquire about all of our schools. And without further ado, we will get into our program. Okay, what makes California special? Photo quiz. This one's a bit of a trick question. Uh, it is a palm tree. <laughs> not really tied to a location necessarily. Um, whoever raises their hand first and yells out a city in California can get the tote bag. Anyone want to take a guess? Which city in California? All right. Perfect, you win. Santa Monica and LA. <laughs> By the end, we're gonna have a whole backstory for this palm tree. <laughs> All right, so what makes California special? Um, California is a great place and we're here to talk about it. Uh, so what are some unique attributes of California that make it appealing? Kari, why don't you go ahead and let us know? Thank you so much, Anya, and thank you for everyone at America for welcoming us so warmly. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. So California, uh, what makes us special? Um, one thing to note, if, if California was its own country, it would have the fifth largest GDP of any country in the world. Um, so in our own sense, we're kind of our own little country, our own little universe with a very, very unique and distinct personality and one that draws a lot of people from around the world, uh, a lot of American diversity, and that's one of the things that really makes us special. Um, of course, for your LLM, your primary concern will be your academics. but what happens outside of your law school is going to greatly influence the type of experience that you have. Um, and when you have, when you're in an a area such as like California, where we have um, just a massive amount of uh, intellectual property and innovation, you're all familiar with Silicon Valley. Um, tourism, of course, is a major um, part of our economy. I heard someone gasp when you heard Disneyland, right? So, um, you know, Disneyland, Hollywood, um, our beaches, et cetera, are major parts of our economy. Agriculture, that's something that people oftentimes don't think about when they think about California, but just the fresh fruits, the fresh, fresh vegetables, um, the environmental concern that comes along with that. Immigration, we share a border on the south. And so we end up having this very rich tapestry that law directly impacts. So when you're looking at going to a law school, um, you're not just looking at what's the courses you'll literally be taking, but in terms of experiential opportunities and practical opportunities, those are gonna be impacted by the industries that surround your law school, and there are so many in California. And that's not to mention just the fun parts of that too that come with that type of diversity. Um, wonderful food, wonderful entertainment. It's really a great place to go to law school and spend a year or more. Um, um, and we find that our students really do find that there is a difference and a value to being in California. Thanks. So when people are looking at LLM programs, it's very common to look at the academic experience, which of course is why you're doing an LLM degree. But Nick, why is it important to consider quality of life as one of the factors when you're looking into what LLM program to attend? I think it's important for everyone to consider the quality of life when um, you're looking for your next academic chapter. So in addition to everything that Kari said, think about California as the land of opportunity. Like he mentioned, there's a lot of opportunities, fields and industries for you to get um, involved and take advantage of. The other thing to consider is also our weather. California has great weather. Um, mostly sunshine year round, so we don't really have a, a lot of rain or snow or cold weather. Um, so that's always nice, um, especially if you want to study on the beach in the middle of the winter. Um, and speaking of the beach, we also have a lot of geographic um, diversity too. And so a lot of our students enjoy that on the weekends, kind of balance their academics and their studies. So you could go to the beach on the weekends, but in the same weekend, you could go to the mountains. So if you want to experience the snow, you could go skiing or snowboarding. And so I think all of that does help to make sure that you have a balance of both your academics and um, making sure that you feel relaxed too. 
all great things to take into consideration. And so California, clearly a great place to visit, uh, but if you're doing your LLM there, sometimes a lot of other people are visiting and living there, and it makes the cost of living rise. Desirable places are more expensive to live in. Um, but Simona, how can students make their experience in California be affordable and accessible? Hello, everyone. California is indeed uh, a little expensive like many other states, right? In, uh, in the United States. But because it's so diverse, there are so many opportunities for um, affordable living and entertainment. So there are different areas in the state. And depending on where you choose to live, then uh, the cost varies, of course, depending on your pocket, your, um, uh, what, what your goals are. But in Southern California and Los Angeles, Really, the choices are so many. I would say there are states within the state. It's, so it, it's crazy. Uh, from LA County, Brentwood, where UCLA is, to downtown LA, to Santa Monica, uh, very, very close to, um, to, the, to downtown LA, so you, Hollywood. It's really, there are, the opportunities are so many. And in addition to affordable living, entertainment is also available and oftentimes for free. There are free events everywhere, uh, access to the museums. I'm thinking um, Loyola Law School is close to the Broad, and there are exhibitions, free exhibitions, uh, almost every weekend. And in addition to that, on campus, all of our schools offer networking events, business uh, opportunities for um, networking to meet people. Those are all free, obviously. So. There are expensive opportunities, but also affordable ones. So the most important thing is to have access to the information. Where is the affordable living? Where are the affordable events? Uh, how can I afford transportation? And all our offices are there to assist you and provide you with that information. Thanks, Simona. Yeah, you will definitely not be alone if you're having these questions. A lot of our students do, and all of us at our institutions uh, are there to help. So a very quick lightning round while we're talking about life in California. Uh, favorite weekend destinations to just get people a little bit excited. Kari, real quick, what is one of yours? I must admit, um, over the weekends, especially because we travel a lot with our jobs. Um, I love to just relax. And the fact that I'm uh, living in Irvine and I'm about 10 minutes away from Newport Beach, uh, one of my favorite things to do is just relax on the beach um, and or uh, check out some of the local free things like, uh, like, like my colleague Simona mentioned. Uh, for example, farmer's markets. Every neighborhood has like these beautiful farmer's markets typically once a week uh, where you can buy fresh ingredients. There's entertainment. Um, it's fun for families. It's fun for just the community, too. So um, I just really enjoy the kind of quieter aspects of, of, of the neighborhood when I'm at home. I didn't hear Disneyland on that list. Well, of course Disneyland. That goes without saying. Like, that's maybe once a month. Yeah. Once a month. <laughs> All right, Nick, what about you? A favorite weekend destination? Yeah, I think one of my favorite places to visit over the weekend is San Diego. So from Irvine, it's about an hour and a half, right? And then from Los Angeles, it's about two hours. But it's a great place to visit. It's a great beach city, so you could always surf, um, lay on the beach if you like to tan. And there's also great food. So if you ever want to try great Mexican food, they have amazing tacos, burritos. Um, but it's just a nice weekend, just kind of un um, relax and unwind. Simona. I love both destinations, and for me, it's hard to pick one. So I would go to the beaches, I would go to Malibu oftentimes, and often bring my notes and my papers there and work there. Uh, but I would also go to San Diego. I love that. And in addition, there is this other place called Ojai that is about an hour drive from LA. It's so different. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a little place filled uh, full of restaurants, clubs. Uh, um, amazing um, Mexican food, and then places where you can buy olive oil, oranges, it's so different. Seems to be truly in another state. Point being, California is so diverse. You really cannot get wrong. 
And I, I'm up here representing Northern California, so I'll go ahead and mention Napa Valley, uh, which a great wine industry. You can go wine tasting, also olive oil, and just see the different, you know, all, see the vineyards. It's really beautiful. You feel like you're in another world. Um, also, Lake Tahoe is one of my favorite places. So that's about three, four hours from the Bay Area, um, and it's an alpine lake. It's wonderful in the winter. They're skiing there. Um, it hosted the Olympics once, so very good skiing. I'm very good at the sport of falling in the snow. You can do that there too. Um, and then Lake Tahoe is also wonderful in the summer, water sports and just experiencing the, the lake up there. So California is just a great place where whether you end up in the northern half and the southern half, you can easily and you should visit all of California. All right, California legal market and another photo quiz. Does anyone know what this photo is of? Oh, got a quick one. That's right, it's a Hollywood <laughs> sign. Great deductive hard. reasoning. Yeah. Really hard to yeah, yeah. Very, very <laughs> tricky. <laughs> you can actually hike also up to the top of the Hollywood sign. So another thing to do on the weekend. All right, so not yet. Um, for the California legal market. So uh, Simona, what are some of the most popular areas of law and the biggest industries in California? I'm very proud of answering this question because California is one of the most, uh, as Carrie said, yes, one of the most solid economy in the U.S., right? So the possibilities for industries, the, the, the opportunities are infinite, to say the least. Uh, as all of you can imagine, entertainment law is a big, big area, major area in California. You know, California is the land of the movie industry. So... Anything concerning or everything concerning copyright, trademark, licensing, you know, everything that, that protects the rights behind TV shows or movies. Or, so that's a major area. And obviously, in addition to that, the second major area is technology. Anya will tell you about Silicon Valley and all the uh, companies that uh, uh, are around Berkeley. Uh, but in addition to that, there are companies, famous ones also in Los Angeles. I think of uh, uh, Fox, Disney, um, and Snapchat, uh, Hulu. They're all there. So imagine the opportunities for experience and work in Southern California. But those are just the most known one. Envi environmental law is a field that is growing. There's been a lot of legislation and development in California, lots of organizations, major ones that are doing something great. And so that is another field to consider. But truly, anything you could think of, because California is big and expanding, solid economy, so truly anything you could think of, from healthcare law to restaurants and hospitality, the opportunities are really, really infinite. In addition to that, major law firms have their offices in California. Offices, law firms like uh, Latham and Walkin, or uh, Oric, or um, uh, White and Case, uh, to, to name just a few. So the opportunities will, for you will be so many. And in Northern California, Silicon Valley, uh, it's a very well-known place where um, Facebook, Google, Facebook's not called Facebook anymore, Twitter's not called Twitter anymore, uh, but those companies, Google um, and uh, Apple, all of those companies are there. So uh, the Northern California is a great place to study if you're interested in entrepreneurship, startups, emerging companies, how all of those get funded, and also new technologies and how do lawyers and the law treat new technologies. So a couple of years ago, everyone was talking about the blockchain, and they're still talking about that, but now everyone's talking about AI. Uh, so there's a really great place to be if you're interested in studying those areas of the law. Um, California has a little bit of everything, of course, so great place to be for all of that. But some of our students have a life outside of California. Um, after their LLM, they're planning to come back home or to another country, um, and they want to you know, make sure that what they learn in their LLM is applicable to their life going forward. Um, so what are the benefits of studying in California for those students who plan to, to continue their career in another country? Who wants to take that one? Happy to take Curry. that one. Um, so much of what we mentioned before um, are portable skills. 
right? Meaning that um, they're not skills or experiences that are gonna be too unique in their usefulness to you in California alone. And that's one of the reasons why uh, many students are drawn to our state and our respective schools, regardless of where they are, where their home country is, or even if they do intend on practicing in a state other than California. Um, the industries have been mentioned many times. Um, what comes along with this from a practical standpoint? Networking, right? Where are your adjunct professors coming from? Where are your clinical professors coming from oftentimes? They're coming from the surrounding community. That, what that means for you is the ability to network, to build networks, to be mentored, um, perhaps to engage in clinical opportunities where you're working under the supervision of a practicing attorney and or faculty member with actual client matters. Having this type of exposure is going to benefit you regardless of whether you stay in California or if you come back here to Jakarta uh, or, or any other part of Indonesia or any other area of the world. And so in that way, um, the exposure that you receive, the network, for some people, the network is the most valuable part, is that when you leave your respective LLM experience, you are taking with you relationships. Relationships that you will count on and that you will rely upon and whom you will, you, they will rely on you for the remainder of your legal career. And so we encourage you to think of it in that way. Not just one year, but an investment in your future. And that's why things such as like weather, you say, okay, yeah, weather's nice, but keep in mind, what does that mean? That means in d December, January, February, you actually get to go out and still be in the community, still work with people. You don't feel like, okay, I need to hibernate like a bear um, <laughs> until the sun comes out again which impacts your ability to make connection with people. And so in terms of getting involved in those industries as a student, building on that networking idea, Nick, how can students do that while they're in their LLM program? So each of our law schools have a number of student organizations or societies, and like everyone mentioned, they're focused on different affinity groups or fields and industries. So it could be a business law society or entertainment law society, or it could be whatever the law school has or the students want to organize. And so that's that one easy place to get involved in and build your network and community because it's right at the law school. So they might have lunchtime workshops or panels and they'll invite local attorneys um, that will share their knowledge and give advice on what the latest trends are. Each of law schools also have continuing legal education departments. And with that, they organize conferences or in, um, institutes that you could take advantage of, and many times attending these events are for free. And so you can meet and network with professionals, not only from Los Angeles or the Bay Area or Orange County, but they will come from all over the United States and share the latest knowledge and insights with you. So it could be on topics like real estate or intellectual property. And then each of our cities, I know, have bar associations. Um, and so those are easy ways, also um, easy ways to get involved in, because as a student, your membership is most likely free. And these local bar associations have different sections or chapters that are focused on also different practice areas that you could um, build your network. And those also have their own networking opportunities. So I think we, when you do join any of our law schools, we'll tell you to um, get involved. But your law school experience is really what you make of it. And we give a lot of different opportunities for you to do that. So just use your time wisely and just take advantage of everything that we have to offer. Thanks. All right. So we're going to take two questions from the audience here before we move on to the next session. Um, I encourage you to ask a question that is very general that can be answered by any of the panelists rather than a specific question towards a specific university. Anyone here want to ask the first one? All right. We have a question from... Hello. Thank you for the presentation. I'm Ruth. Um, and my question would be what... I forgot the slide that says uh, specialization in human rights law. I think it's UCL, if I'm not mistaken. But um, if any of you can also explain why uh, California is the best place to study international law or human rights law, because I know that my dream is to work for the UN. And then the center of the UN, I know, is in Geneva. Um, but I know that they're opening another office in New York as well. So uh, maybe from your expertise and from your law school, you can explain uh, what kind of um, LLM is the best to pursue my uh, legal career in human rights law, and maybe some clinics or professor that uh, you can uh, share with me and all the audience. Thank you. 
so I'm happy to approach this from a general perspective, and then um, we'll have a tabling opportunity afterwards where you can speak to individual schools about clinical offerings and specific courses. Um, but I will say this, and, and it's, um, this may not be a particularly popular response, um, as I'm at a, a U.S. Uh, uh, embassy um, a branch here, but we do have human rights issues in the United States. Um, many of our large metropolitan areas in California have a massive homelessness crisis. Um, I would argue that that's a human rights issue. Uh, we share a southern border with Mexico, and I'm sure for those of you who keep up on the American uh, political state of being, realize that that's a heavily, heavily politicized and contentious issue. Um, many of our law schools dedicate a great deal of resources to, um, to, to public impact, public affairs. Um, we want our students not to just think about the law from an intellectual perspective, but to realize that the law impacts people's lives in a very real and very practical way. Um, and as lawyers, oftentimes we're the ones who are on the front lines of ensuring that our country lives up to the ideals that we profess um, in, in, in reality, not just you know, in, um, as we speak about them in, in, in popular discourse or when we refer to historical documents with certain platitudes of life, liberty, and justice, et cetera. But um, how do we live those? How do we live those more and more and better and better on a daily basis? So I will say um, human rights is not an intellectual pursuit, right? At the end of the day, it's practical. It affects people. Um, and in studying in California, you will have the opportunity to some, many of our clinics, many of our professors work on very practical issues, some of which I mentioned before, homelessness, um, immigration, et cetera. And so uh, California is a wonderful place, uh, particularly if you're studying in the U.S., to both have some of those wonderful experiences that we talked about, but also some of the things that we struggle with as a country, right? We have a very important election coming up. Um, and these issues will be debated. They will be discussed. Um, so um, in that in way, yes, you will be on the front line um, and, uh, and you will have the backing of our institutions because these are things we believe in wholeheartedly in terms of affecting positive change. All right, thank you. Second question, that would be the last question for this session. Anyone? No questions, really? All right, okay, we have one right here. Uh, hello, my name is Akmal. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude for the presentations. I've got uh, actually two questions. But uh, are there any LLM class in your respective law schools that begin the study in the spring instead of fall? And are there any double LLM and MPP program in your respective law schools? Thank you. So you can take a. I I, I need a clarification though. Okay. Hi, uh, you you are you are asking whether we have uh, programs that start in spring? Yes, in this moment. Yeah, so, and this is a question that I can answer. Loyola Law School does have oh. a, an, an opportunity for uh, starting in spring. So that is a program that starts rather than August. It yeah. starts in spring and it does have the same curriculum as the other ones. So there is no variation except that it does start in spring. That's a great question, though, to ask the individual schools afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Each school has, will have a different answer and uh, more information to give you about thank that. Thank you very much, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Uh, so I think we can move on to the second session. Thank you so much, uh, Nicholas. Thank you so much, Simona and um, Kari. Did I pronounce it correctly? Got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. And, you know, everyone, you can meet them, uh, respectively, on the outside, uh, outside on their booth. Um, but thank you so much for your participation. Right, thanks. Give a round of applause, please. And should we welcome the second? Yeah, absolutely. So we have Jun Sakamoto, Dean of Enrollment for UC Law San Francisco, and Tiffany Parnell, Assistant Director uh, at UCLA School of Law. Give a round of applause, everyone, please. <laughs> All right, very popular topic, but before we get going on that, we'll continue our photo quiz. Does anyone know what this photo is of? Well, let's, we'll give somebody else an opportunity just yeah. in case, and, and if no one an guesses, answer. because okay. it is difficult. The gentleman with the black hat. 
Pacific Coast Highway. Highway. It is not the Pacific Coast Highway, but that's a good guess. Anyone else? It was featured in an HBO miniseries not too long ago, in case anyone saw that. Anyone else want to take a guess? You got a guess over here. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> was somebody told the answer? <laughs> All right, Anya. Okay, this is Big Sur. It is in uh, Northern California. As you can tell, it's right on the coast there. Um, really beautiful location. You can add it to your list of weekend destinations. All right, so here we go with the bar exam. Uh, we get asked a lot of questions, and honestly, we could probably do a two-hour presentation on only the bar exam. But uh, we don't have that kind of time, so just give us the highlights here. June, tell us about the California bar. Is it important? How can schools help us out? All right, thank you for this question. Um, the bar exam is absolutely not a requirement for anybody who does an LLM in the United States. Um, the bar exam is really something that you would want to consider if you have plans to stay in the United States to practice um, sometime in the future. You know, on your F-1 visas, you must come back to your home country. Um, but for people who, um, who are planning on hoping one day to be in the United States, then it would be required if you'd like to work for a law firm or work in-house counsel at a corporation. Um, otherwise, it's, it's not a requirement. Um, there are some employers overseas um, who do maybe find a prestige factor in, um, in hiring people who have passed a U.S. bar exam. So if that's um, the case for an employer that you are hoping to work for one day, you should probably reach out um, and, and ask if it makes a difference to have a bar license in the United States. So the way that bar licensure works in the US is every state has its own bar licensing requirements and each state has its own bar exam. So the best thing you can do if you're even just thinking about the bar exam is um, one, to come to our websites. We all have um, a lot of information about the various bars and the requirements. Also reach out to us but also go to the National Bar Examiner's website, ncbe, I think, dot com. Um, so take a look at what the requirements are there. Um, the way that the bar exam would work, if you're interested in taking it, is um, you would start one of our programs in early August, most likely. Um, you would finish your first semester in November, December. You would start your second semester in January. You would graduate in May. It is lightning fast, this program. Um, right after graduation, you would join a commercial bar prep company. So all of our law programs will teach you how to think like a lawyer. They will teach you how to engage in really complicated um, thinking. Um, but we do not teach to the bar exam. We don't teach you how to take it. Um, we're teaching you sort of how to be a good lawyer. So what um, all of our Juris Doctor students and any LLM student who wants to take the bar, what we tell them is to look into commercial bar prep courses. There are a number available. They all come to our campuses in the fall and the spring, so you can talk to the uh, providers individually and figure out what their style of teaching is, how much it costs, all of the details, and then you can choose. But we are on campus to help you figure that out. Um, so you would start your commercial bar prep right after graduation. You would study for half of May, June, and July, and the bar exam is at the end of July every year. Um, it's two, one to two days, um, just depending on the state. California has a two-day bar exam on the last two days of July. Um, and then you would find out your results in November. Um, and all of our campuses, and I keep mentioning this, we are here for our LLM students. So there is nothing you would need to figure out on your own. If you are interested in even just thinking about maybe taking the bar exam, your faculty advisors on campus will help you from day one, trying to you know, help you figure out which classes to take, which support services are available. We have bar preparation courses as well as programming throughout the year. Um, and so, uh, 
talk to us, we will help you. Um, but again, it is not a requirement, so don't be too worried. I mean, the bar exam is, is not easy, but it is doable as long as you are thinking through the planning, so start your planning early. Thanks, June. So much great information there. Again, we could talk about the bar forever. Uh, so feel free to come by, stop by, and ask us more questions. Or just in the future when you have more questions. You might not have them now, but like June said, we're here for you. OK, photo quiz. Uh, does anyone know exactly what beach this is? Okay. Malibu. Good guess. Sure, yeah. We are actually not sure. So <laughs> that was a bit of a trick question, and now you win anyway. Good job. <laughs> All right, so we heard a talk about volunteer and OPT. So I'm going to start with you, Tiffany. Uh, what are some experiential learning opportunities that students can pursue during their LLM program? OK, great, great question. Um, just for those who maybe are not totally familiar, we've referenced this earlier in today's presentation, but experiential learning is applying what you're learning in class, the theory, the foundations of law, the concepts, to practical, real-life scenarios, cases. So schools like ours are invested in merging the two, getting you that academic exposure, understanding the foundations, but then allowing you the space to apply that to real-world settings so that you have some familiarity going out into the real world. So ex experiential offerings can include externships, um, clinics, live client simulations, and pro bono opportunities. So an externship is essentially like an internship, except you're working for academic credit rather than for pay. Um, and many of our schools will give you some guidance about where that kind of work can be done, what the process is in order to you know, get that approved. Um, so definitely talk to each of our schools because the process of pursuing that would be different by um, each institutional standard but it is intended to give you some in-depth exposure in a real-world setting where you're working with a lawyer on very specific needs. Um, so an externship is very practical to a business um, or an organization that is working. A clinic um, could be academic for credit in a class environment, or it could be extracurricular, meaning that it's not necessarily tied to a course, but that's done under the supervision of a faculty member um, or an attorney. And again, you're working on a real life issue, um, applying what you're learning in a classroom setting if it is a class, or applying the things that you've learned in class to an extracurricular organization. Um, and then live client simulations are kind of mock versions of that. So maybe you're not working with a real client, but you're working with um, a simulation, and again, that would be taught by a faculty member. And then the last one that I mentioned was pro bono opportunities, which basically um, does have some variability based on where you're, where you're located in terms of what types of resources are available at the school. But all of our institutions will offer you guidance about how to get involved in doing pro bono service, which can be beneficial if you intend to take a bar exam, for instance, down the road. But you're working with individuals who maybe do not have access to or resources for legal representation. Um, and some of our institutions have centers dedicated purely to identifying those opportunities, connecting you with communities in need, um, all surrounding legal issues. So those are myriad, the numbers of ways to get involved, but it is meant to allow you to apply what you're learning in class to a real world setting. Thanks, Tiffany. And so a lot of our students uh, take advantage of these opportunities, and you should consider that as well. Uh, for a lot of our students, they're hoping to maybe get some hands-on work experience after they graduate. And so the way to do that is to pursue OPT, which stands for Optional Practical Training. It is connected to an F1 visa, um, and again, visa stuff is stuff you can talk to Education USA about. Um, Applying for OPT is easier than finding a job during OPT. OPT gives you up to 12 months of work authorization in the United States related to your course of study. So in this case, it is law, which is pretty broad. Um, and so a lot of people like to take advantage of that opportunity, stick around, and get a little more hands-on work experience. All of our schools have advisors and have support to help you pursue your educational opportunities and also to help you pursue your professional development, which in this case might include finding a position uh, to work in during OPT. Um, 
our advisors are also available to help you if you are you know, planning to go back home right after, but then you want to consider coming back to the US later, or you want to take the bar even after you graduate. So once you're a part of our community, you are forever a part of our community. We don't abandon you um, whenever you have questions about your career, especially with regard to the United States with the bar exam. Um, our advisors and our schools are always available to you. So that's something that a lot of our students take advantage of as well. But uh, it's not, a lot, not every one of our students is looking for a position in the US, even after graduation. Like I said, a lot of you like where you come from. You have jobs that you enjoy. Uh, you want to pursue your career um, not in California, but in many, many other places. So Tiffany, maybe you can uh, help everybody understand what are just professional development opportunities uh, that students can take advantage of so that when they graduate, they are an even more well-rounded professional. Yeah, um, there were already a couple of references to this earlier. I believe my colleague from UC Irvine mentioned it. Um, while you're an LLM, you basically have access to so many resources and people. Um, and that is something that sets you up for success after you graduate, no matter where you go. And I think being in California specifically is a way to tap into so many options that may not necessarily be available in other parts of the country because of this very global perspective, this very diverse culture that we have as a state trickles down into the experience at the university or in the, the institutional level. And so what you take from doing an LLM in California with you after you graduate, regardless of where you go, is the ability to think globally, to have built relationships with people from all walks of life, all backgrounds who then become your network, whether that's professional or personal, but in professional contexts, those are people that you may get referrals from in terms of opportunities after you've been working for several years or even right after you've graduated. A lot of the people that you would build connections with during the programs are individuals that are the best and the brightest in their respective fields and they will go on to be the movers and shakers of industry. So you just tap into a network that transitions beyond just the time that you're there as a student, and it is a global network. Um, and then those resources that you have access to during the, the year that you're there, professional development opportunities through career development offices, um, that helps get you in the mindset of you can always turn to the university, to our staff and administration as um, a resource moving forward, not just in this isolated period of time, but in the beyond. So you have a network you can fall back on from um, a university support perspective. But it is your network, and it is the alumni you've built connections with, the faculty you've built connections with, and it is being able to think like a lawyer, have gained those skills that maybe not ev other people from um, another jurisdiction or in your jurisdiction may be familiar with. So you are then able to be billed as an expert moving beyond and having the confidence to do that um, in whatever route you choose. All right, application process and photo quiz. Does anyone know what this building is? It was designed by a famous architect. Well, you already answered. We had a hand up here from somebody so else. We, oh, this, so this gentleman right here. Yeah. Sorry. You hear it? Can you pass the microphone? From museum. Isn't that the Guggenheim Museum? We must again. It is not a museum, but it's a good guess. Okay. Oh, pass that one down. Is it the Walt Disney Concert Hall? It sure is. It's the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles, California. Great job. All right, so after all of everything you've heard, you are definitely planning to apply, right? We convinced you to apply to all of our schools here in uh, California. So let's get a little bit more information on the application process. June, can you uh, tell us what that might involve? Absolutely. So this is the nuts and bolts version of how to apply for an LLM program in the United States. Um, generally, the process is the same for any school in the US, but along the margins, there are going to be differences. So please be sure to visit our websites and also reach out. 
um, to each individual law school you're interested in. So I know we'll be hearing, all six of us will be hearing from you. Um, but generally, everyone who applies to an LLM program in the United States will go through the Law School Admissions Council, LSAC. Um, you would go to lsac.org, and that is the, um, that's the website where you will create your profile, and then you will have access to um, every law school's application. Um, so the TOEFL or the IELTS, generally the TOEFL is preferred, um, but an English proficiency test is required. There are waivers available, however, so if you completed an undergraduate or graduate degree in English, even if it is outside of the United States, there will be um, a section on the application that you can um, ask for a waiver or you can email us directly seeking a waiver. Um, but otherwise, uh, a TOEFL or the IELTS is required. Each school has its um, own recommended minimum or required minimum score, so please also go on our websites to figure that out or come talk to us afterwards. Um, and then generally the pieces of the application are official transcripts. So for every graduate and undergraduate um, program you attended, you would ask, uh, go to lsac.org, there is a transcript request form. You will submit that to your school and then your school will submit the transcripts directly to LSAC. So the benefit of using LSAC for everybody is that um, instead of asking your school to send six different transcripts to each of our schools, um, you only need to ask them to submit your transcript one time to LSAC and they will disperse um, the transcripts to each school you are applying to. Um, we also require a personal statement. Um, personal statements can have very specific questions or they can be very general. Um, for the general questions, my recommendation to you all is um, to let us know about who you are. So most law schools do not have an interview process. Some do, but most do not. So this, your application really is the only way we can figure out who you are. And even more importantly, from the admission side, we can see who is a good fit for our programs. And what I mean by that is um, we are taking a year of your lives to have, you will have a transformational experience in any of our programs, but it is a full year um, of your life and maybe, you know, two if you're staying for OPT. So we really want to make sure that we are providing you the best possible year. So if you are interested in, you know, entertainment law or human rights law, you want to make sure that um, you are choosing a school that has entertainment law or human rights law. You want to spell it out for us. So we are looking for reasons um, to, to accept people. Uh, we have, you know, an excellent human rights program and a tech program, but I always use this example. If you're interested in shipping law, maritime law, we only have two courses at UC Los San Francisco in maritime law. So if you say you want to be the best shipping lawyer who's ever existed, and that's in your personal statement to us, then I'm not going to think that you're meant for our program because we're not going to be able to provide you what you need to thrive as a student or as um, a lawyer. So do your research about what our programs offer. Make sure that you are telling us what it is that you're interested in and why our school in particular um, is the school that you are most interested in. Um, we also require resumes, and I know that EdUSA has a wonderful program to help with the resumes. U.S. resumes look different than, you know, Every country has its own style. For application purposes, we are fine accepting a resume that is traditional in Indonesia. That's absolutely fine. You don't need to tailor it to the American style. Um, what I will say is if there are um, gaps in your resume, then we wonder why. So try not to have after, you know, once you start your undergraduate degree, try not to have huge lapses of time. Let us, don't make us um, have to fill in the blanks of your history. And it doesn't have to be, you know, I, you know, cured cancer. It could just be, you know, I volunteered during the, this time during the summer or, or after I graduated. 
Um, and then letters of recommendation are the final piece to the application materials that you submit. Um, the number of uh, letters differs by school. Most require two, some require three, some will allow you to submit more, so definitely check on the websites to see what our requirements are. And the, the trick that I will give you for letters of recommendation is some people know really fancy people. Maybe you know a Supreme Court justice over here in this country. Um, the thing is, if the person who's writing your letter does not actually know who you are and how you engage in really complicated ideas or how you work with people in a classroom setting, the letter is not going to be very um, helpful to us. So rather than choosing the person with the fanciest title you can think of, Choose the person who actually understands you, a professor who you've had maybe in two courses, three courses, um, who actually knows how you engage with the classroom material or a supervisor who knows how you engage in legal um, ideas. Those are the letters that are the most helpful. Um, and finally, we all have different deadlines, so also look on our websites to find out what those are. All right, our final photo quiz. Does anyone know what mountain this is? And if you've already answered, give somebody else a chance first. OK, I want to take a guess. I, I saw some people pointing. OK, the gentleman right there. <laughs> OK, thank you for the opportunity. I will try to answer that Yosemite. It is Yosemite, that's right. This is Half Dome Mountain in Yosemite National Park. Another wonderful weekend destination. <laughs> right. All right, so we can take a question from the, um, from the audience here, but before we go to the audience, we do have a question from our audience online, from Josh from Instagram. So his question is, what do law schools look for in an applicant? Or I guess, how do you guys select your students? It's a really great question, and every school probably does it slightly differently, but one thing that I know is true for all of the schools that are represented here is that we do holistic application review. So what that means is we will look at all parts of your application put together. Uh, it, we don't have any immediate cutoffs or immediate acceptances. So for example, even if you got the absolute best grade in your undergraduate law degree, that's not an automatic admission to any of our schools. It's very good, and you should definitely apply if you are you know, the top uh, law student at your school. Um, but we still will review every single piece of the application. So again, if you know your grades were strong, but not the strongest, We'll look at the other parts of your application as well. If you have work experience or internships, we will look at that. We will read the personal statement that is very meaningful to us. Uh, we will read your letters of recommendation and see what people have uh, said about you. Um, we can usually get a lot of interesting information uh, from letters of recommendation. And we look at your CV. Um, there's all the different pieces that we kind of put together and balance together. Um, all of our individual schools likely also have advice about their school specifically, so I recommend that you reach out to each individual school that you're planning to apply to um, and find out a little bit more about their specific requirements and uh, what exactly they're looking to hear. Okay, um, anyone wanna add something to it? Okay, I, I'll just chime in very br briefly to say that um, not every applicant should look the same. We want to see people that reflect different backgrounds, different experiences. So if you and a friend are applying and your profiles look completely different, do not let that alarm you. Um, that is great. We see a lot of value in diversity. So know that we care about diversity and it makes for a more enjoyable experience for you on our end once you're there as a student as well to get to know people from diverse backgrounds, whether that's coming right out of law school or having many years of work experience. So don't let that de deter you from applying if you're not sure that your profile matches a cookie cutter profile. June, I think you want to add something. I do, thanks. So the one, uh, I might be preempting a question here, but the one piece that hasn't come up yet is scholarships. And I do want to note that each school has institutional scholarships to award. The criteria is different, um, and the application process, if there is one, is different. But one question I get a lot from applicants is, 
Does my request for a scholarship affect my admissions decision to the law school? And the answer for our six law schools is no. Need for, for um, financial assistance does not affect whether or not we will admit you. We are admitting you on the, the merit of your application, not based on your need. So I do want to stress that if finances are important and finances are important to everybody, um, don't let that be um, a reason why you don't apply or don't let it don't don't make yourself feel like you have less than a stellar chance just because you are seeking financial assistance. Right, thank you, June. I think that answers a lot of questions from our audience here and online. Uh, but I think I also want to reiterate that, meaning because it's a holistic application review, um, don't get discouraged if they feel like oh I don't have enough, uh, I don't have a long experience of work, I don't have a good GPA or like the best GPA uh, during my undergrad. That's fine. Right? Okay. Absolutely. Yes. All Please right. still apply. All right. So we have a question from the audience from this side. Hi. Okay. Hi. Hello. My name is Dita. I have a question on the LSAC. So um, I'm not fully aware of what's going on inside the platform. And this might be a little technical, the question. I mean, like, because, like, when I first clicked on the website, it says that I have to, like, I don't pay twenty dollars or something for the for me to, in order for me to sign up and go inside the LSAC website. So I'm just wondering because like you were saying that um, okay in terms of the uh, official transcripts, you said that we can own, uh, wait, uh, we, you said that we can just submit it to the website and then the website will then spread the transcript to respective universities. But like okay, so my question is. What if like I have like several options? Like for example, I'm going to apply to five different law schools, and then um, you mean six law schools? Oh, six <laughs> law schools. Yes, <laughs> apologies. I mean six law schools, and then um, I understand that what I'm trying to do is that I'm going to make a different personal statement. Like for example, if I'm going to apply to UCLA or Loyola, I will like adjust my personal statement. Uh, in accordance with respective schools, but then um, is is LSAC the only platform that we can use for us in order to apply for the LLM program, or is there any other platforms? Because I, I'm kind of confused on how, like, the distribution of the personal statement, etc. Sure, great question. So LSAC does have fees associated with their platform that we are not able to do anything about. Um, they do have a few fee waivers available, so you would email LSAC directly to see if they have any left. Um, each of our schools have application fees that are separate from the LSAC fee. Uh, many of us do offer application fee waivers, so that's another reason to reach out to us because then we can send you this long code of letters and numbers that will help you waive our school-specific fees. Um, in terms of the, the ways to apply, lsac.org is the best way to be able to apply to a number of schools, so the six of us. Um, there are law schools, however, that will accept individual paper applications. Well, they're like fillable PDFs at this point, I'm sure. Um, and so there are certain schools that will let you apply directly to them. The problem, though, is that you will then have to ask your school to submit transcripts to LSAC for those schools and then to each individual school. Um, also, letters of recommendation, you would have to ask your recommendation rec recommenders to send letters to LSAC and then also to the individual schools you're applying to. But it is possible to do um, a combination. I would say the best way to go about it is to reach out to at least one or maybe even all of the schools you're applying to and just ask about their particular process and ask them for help and tips, right? All of us staff, we work with people who are applying every year. So we know a lot of the questions that come up um, and we have a lot of good kind of answers and, and ways to help you. And maybe even find some alumni. If you know any alumni from uh, your country or from your school who have gone to the U.S., they sometimes have good tips for how to navigate that process. Process. Okay, does that answer your question? Yeah? Okay. Any more questions from the audience here? I think everyone's pretty shy. Oh, okay, we have one right there. Hi, uh, thank you. I'm Jati, and I wanted to ask, is there any sort of uh, experience or whether it be work or volunteer organizational that 
uh, law schools in California value to be important or perhaps something that signifies a potential in those students? Thank you. All, all, all of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all types of experience are valuable experience. Um, there are some programs that do have expectations about your professional work experience prior to beginning the program. So you'll find that if you look beyond just our six institutions, that there's some variability there. But I would say any experience that you have, whether that's scholarly in terms of academic uh, publications, if you're on like a d dissertation track and you've been published, um, that's valuable for us to know. We also care about practical work experience if you have been working as a lawyer in a firm or working in a nonprofit in a legal capacity. I think what matters more is your own particular story and how you weave that into the goals that you set for yourself by coming to do an LLM. So if you want to get some more expertise or experience to supplement work that you've done by doing a specialization, that could be helpful for us to know and maybe it would come through in your personal statement, but um, there's not some formula that we're looking for in terms of work experience at a certain organization or in a particular industry. Um, so I would say, we value disclosing what experience you do have, whether that's volunteer or, or long-term. If you don't have any, that's okay too for many schools. Um, but I would say just check with the schools individually about any specifics. All right. Um, I'm going to give a chance to our previous speakers to add something to it if there's something to add. Maybe Nick or um, Carrie or Simona. Do you want to add something to it? Um, thank you. Um, just very briefly, I um, just want to echo a point that my colleagues made. There's no stereotypical or perfect applicant. So don't try and make yourself the perfect applicant. If you're passionate about something, it shines through. Um, and Tiffany mentioned this. Like if it, it may not seem like it has anything to do with the law. If you're passionate about it, you're going to end up probably excelling at it. If you're passionate about it, you'll probably, start, you'll probably assume leadership positions in it. And that is going to make you outstanding. We have people who are passionate about cooking, passionate about you know, things that you wouldn't seem to, to relate to law, but it actually makes them more interesting as candidates. Because obviously, we all, everyone who's applying to our school went to law school. Like you're clearly invested in law. Um, we want to actually have the opportunity to learn more about you and what your passions are, whether they lie in the law or, or seemingly outside of it. All right, great. OK, that answers your question? Yeah, OK. So we'll take another question from the audience here. Anyone? No? If there's no question from the audience here, we'll go back to our online audience. So there is one question that I find very interesting. Is there a prerequisite for an international student to study law in the US? The only prerequisite is to have graduated from your first law degree. <laughs> so <laughs> that is, an, and it's different country by country, but whatever the law degree is in your country, you should graduate. Um, and that's the only thing that is the absolute requirement. Um, after that, apply when it makes sense for you. And, and we've mentioned different schools have, you know, different amounts of work expectations or requirements or hopes. Um, but you can find a law program that will be very excited to get your application at whatever stage makes sense for you. So if you have just finished graduating and you want to do your LLM right after that, and that makes sense for you, you should apply then. If you want to work for a little bit and then do an LLM degree, then you should apply then. Um, the only thing that we would say, an, an immediate no, is if you do not have a law degree. Oh, okay. And I just, a technical sure. point is just, you can be completing your final year of law school and apply, and as long as you hold the degree before you start our program, that would make you eligible. Okay, well that's interesting. All right, one more question from the audience here. Been great question so far. Okay. Hi. Uh, hello, my name is Andre, and I'm currently working at the law firms in Indonesia. Uh, I'm still figuring out yeah, what is my passion in law, and uh, I'm, I'm currently in rotations in M&As and then dispute and other stuff like that. But my question is, uh, you mentioned that the benefits of obtaining LLM in 
California is about the networking, about the alumni and stuff like that, yeah, and then the entertainment, Disneyland, and like that. <laughs> yeah, but, but my real question is, if, if I want to practice uh, lawyering in Indonesia, and I want to be like, I guess, the best one, but I don't know which industry that I will involve in the future, but uh, how studying LLM in California will like, I don't know, uh, advance my career in Indonesia or in Jakarta, and in Indonesia specific law, yeah. I think that's my question. Interesting question. Anyone want to take? Yeah, great question. I know Tiffany, you have some thoughts on yeah, that. Yeah, so I, I do have some thoughts. I think everybody's plans post LLM are going to look different, for, um, depending on what you want to do, what you feel that you can explore. I think the benefit of doing one of our programs is that you have a lot of room, a lot of potential to explore further. So you could be working in M and A. You could be working in intellectual property, you could be working in any capacity before going into the program. And then when you come to a school like one of ours, you can do that. You can continue to focus on those areas that interest you, but you also have the flexibility to explore other avenues. So you can make yourself a little bit more of an agile attorney post LLM by getting the foundational knowledge, the skills that correspond to having a wider purview, a wider understanding of the law you also are going to another country. So you already have your background in Indonesia, and then you can then be the American expert after you've graduated from the LLM program because you will have spent a year focusing primarily from a US perspective. The, there are com comparative or international law courses that you would take, but I think the, the expertise that you're gaining is going to be advantageous to you on the market after you leave or in whatever capacity you pursue post LLM. But then you also want to leverage those networks that you mentioned, you know, those people that you connect with, whether that's faculty, alumni, fellow students, they tend to lift everybody up after you've graduated. A rising tide lifts all boats, I think is the saying. Um, everybody goes on to do their own independent things and that's that's great, but your network also creates opportunity. It's kind of a self-promoting um, thing. So you can always call upon individuals, whether that's in Indonesia or afterwards. Maybe you have client referrals from people that you were in classes with after you've completed the program. So that's a couple of my points. I don't know if other members of my team. Curry has some thoughts also. So one quick point, and I'm going to also hold space for my colleague, Simona. So I'm, I'm gonna, I don't mean to get too esoteric here, but in terms of speaking and articulating how you will be expected to interact with the law is something that's very unique in a US legal classroom. Your professors, they are not going to ask you what's the correct answer, like you know, A, B, C, what's, what's, what's the best thing that should happen here? We're gonna be much more concerned about how you think about the law. Um, and, that, and that is a skill set that is transferable to law and beyond, right? Not just law practice in Indonesia, but in terms of the way you, um, it, it, it's funny, um, I, I think many people who are in relationships or partnered or families with American lawyers, they're like, oh my goodness, right? Because you're always like, well, it depends, right? Like, it depends upon this. And, and it's not our way of not wanting to give an answer, but you're, you're, you're asked to view the law in this sense of, this dynamic sense, right? Think of it like as, as a prism. Right, and as light enters the prism, you're being asked, how if I vary that angle ever so slightly? What if a slight fact pattern changes? What if timing changes? What if jurisdiction changes? How might that, how might that change the outcome? Right, how might you argue that case differently if you were in the defense perspective versus a prosecutor's perspective? Right, so you're not being asked, okay, what's the right answer here? You're actually being, um, and I, I defer to Simona because she's also a musical conductor, um, but that's also what the classroom was like in, in the US, where the professor, she is not just giving you answers, right? She's asking you. Um, you are the symphony. They may be directing, you know, more of this, less of that, et cetera. But actually, it's a student in your perspective that's shaping how the conversation goes. Um, and for many students, that is, and even for American students, because that is not how we are educated in our undergraduate, in our high school experiences. Um, it is kind of evolutionary for even US students, because you're being actually asked to engage in the subject matter, not just to sit back and passively 
you know, pick up the, the morsels of knowledge that your professor might be laying down. So I would say in that way, and what we've heard from the various graduates that we've had, um, is that it is a, certainly uh, accelerates uh, the way you think about law, regardless of where you may end up practicing. And so Mona. I wanted to contribute to my um, wonderful colleagues' answers to you. I started my career as an LLM student. That's how I started. I'm originally from Italy. So like you, when I started, uh, I, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do, but I was sure what I didn't want to do. So maybe that's your case. So I knew that I didn't want to do human rights at that point. I knew that I didn't want to do criminal justice. At that point, I knew that I was going to be either a banking and finance, a trial lawyer, right? So that helped me select. So building on what uh, um, uh, my um, colleague Tiffany said first, she gave you a very important uh, idea, which is the following. If you're not sure what you want to do next, uh, take foundational courses. Don't take the specialization. We have several spe specializations, but don't take one. Take foundational courses like contracts or constitutional law or torts, right? And then building on what Kari said, also super important. You are part of a group. We use the Socratic method. And the Socratic method is intended to uh, push you to think and develop your critical thinking which is something that in many countries we don't do, many other countries we don't do. Uh, there is a professor who lectures and the student learns and then go to the exam and then repeat what he learned. So in the US, what is really transformative is, as Carrie said, being part of a team, being part of a symphony, I love that. And so you really learn from your colleagues uh, who are both LLM students and JD students. So imagine what that does to you. There is no comparison. It, it changed my life. So that's, you know, I, I'm, I now do what I always uh, uh, was meant to do, I think, and it all started in the US. So strongly, strongly recommend it. But mostly do it in California and do it with us. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Simona. Um, that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you for the great questions. Thank you for the speakers. Um, don't forget, we still have an exhibition outside. So if you have further questions uh, regarding a specific school, please feel free to meet any of the speakers right outside. Um, and we hope to see you again very soon at the next Ad America event. And I'm going to give the floor back to our MC. Okay, thank you, Kali. And can we have another round of applause for our speakers today? And thank you so much, everyone, for joining our event today. I hope that everyone gained a lot of knowledge insights from, and insights from today's event. And we would also like to thank our speakers and also moderator for sharing to us their knowledge throughout this event. And earlier in this event, we had a social media quiz for our online audience. And the question was, which of the following is not a degree that allows you to practice law in the U.S.? And the correct answer to that is B, Master of Legal Studies. Sharat goes out to at Lutfi Amelia 26 from Instagram for answering the question correctly. Now, for those of you who might want to attend more events here in Ad America, you can visit our website at www.acamerica.or.id for our event updates and more information. And you can also follow us on our social medias at AT America on Instagram, Facebook, and also Twitter. Once again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining our event today. My name is Ara, and see you soon at the next Ad America event. Thank you, everyone. Do a picture with all of the speakers. Okay.